Thank you for coming. Uh, come, grab your pizzas and drinks, and come over here. Let's clear some seats in the front. Right, cool. Thanks, guys. So thank you very much for coming to tonight's event. We are really excited about this topic. Uh, normally, 90% of our uh, meetups are extremely technical and about coding. Uh, but today we're going to talk about something very important to all of us. But how, if you are able to code, how you can uh, really do magic with this knowledge and with the ability to build things through code. So, uh, without much delay, we're going to do a quick introduction uh, of ourselves, uh, Code Chrysalis, and also our sponsors, and then turn it over to Pio, our guest speaker. All right. So who knows, uh, who's, who's been here the first time? All right, all right. Who's an engineer, software engineer? <coughs> okay, that's great. So most of you aren't, that's awesome. Um, so Code Chrysalis is a three month software engineering bootcamp in Tokyo. I think I just lost my voice. Uh, thanks, Yan. Usually I Yan's been sick the whole day. And, uh, <laughs> um, our mission, we have three main missions, uh, very quickly. Uh, first one, we came to Japan to create software engineering leaders. We, want, we, are, we are a very small school, we only uh, graduate small numbers, but we want them to go out there and lead the industry. Two, coming to Japan, we realized how little or how few women are represented in tech. This is a problem globally, but so much more here in Japan. So Yan, who was doing a lot of stuff back in San Francisco as well, has taken it upon herself and Code Chrysalis to <coughs> <coughs> oh, no. really drive this ambition. <laughs> and finally build community. This is why we do these events. We believe that these kind of meetups should be free, knowledgeable people should be sharing with the masses. Uh, many, many, many events in Japan uh, are very expensive to be part of. So what we want to do is, we're trying our best. We've done about 150 <coughs> events in the last 15 months. Uh, it's, it's hard work, uh, but it's very rewarding to us to see your faces and see people make new connections, build networks, and also learn something. And today's meetup is also going to be partly uh, a, a presentation and lecture from PO as well as a workshop that we can start thinking about what we just learned. All right, we have three main programs. Um, our bread and butter product that we came to Japan to create is a three month immersive program where we make you a software engineer. But then we realized that in Japan, we had to also create supplementary programs to make that feasible. So we created an English class as well as a foundation class for beginners. Um, yeah, next slide. Uh, just to give you an idea of who comes to our programs, we have people from all over the world coming to our programs. Um, as well as, it's very interesting, we have actual software engineers and non-technical people both uh, represented in our classes. This is what's unique about our program. We have people from all walks of life, musicians, English teachers, uh, current engineers, all coming together to further their knowledge uh, and, and uh, acquire their skill. Uh, admissions are not easy. It's not an easy school to get into. But we encourage everybody can to do it, and, and, and everybody can if they really want to do this. Uh, first step is an application process online, which is actually a coding challenge. You can't even write your name without cracking the code. So we check for your ability to do some coding at that point. Second, you have to go through and uh, do a technical assessment with our uh, software engineers, sometimes with Yan. Uh, and, uh, and this is testing your ability to communicate as well as think <coughs> on the spot, ask good questions. It's not about getting the code right every time. And finally, once you, do, once you get through that, we give you what's called a two, uh, uh, um, pre-course, uh, pre which is like homework. Eight different projects, takes about two months if you're a beginner to complete. It's a lot of work before you even come in. And when you come in, then the magic happens here, back in the lab there, and you do all these things I'm not going to talk about, every one of them, I don't want to bore you. But it's also teaching you not only skills to build full stack applications, but more importantly, the soft skills that are needed to make 
create a great engineer. So communication skills, empathy for the users, uh, leadership skills, teamwork, these are very important skills we believe, as well as learning how to build these applications fast with using modern methodologies. We are very much into what's called uh, uh, Lean Startup and, and, uh, and Extreme Programming. Uh, these are practices we will be uh, doing, practicing every day and, uh, and also doing things called test driven development, continuous integration development. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about more of that if you want later. Um, so far, students who have received offers to date, we've only, uh, only graduated five classes. Uh, our sixth class is actually in progress right now. I see them still inside the room. Uh, these are some of the companies who have made offers. Um, missing here is companies like Sony, NTT, uh, even um, fast retailing, um, Uniqlo, yeah, those guys. So it's been awesome to see uh, real techno technology companies, you know, come and grab our students. Um, these are some of the companies who support us. If you are amongst uh, someone who wants to support us, just uh, let us know later. We can figure out how to work together. But these are some companies that have come, and come together to support us. Uh, the English communication program that I mentioned before was created to help uh, Japanese engineers who struggle with communicating. Uh, I, I believe every Japanese who have gone through K-12 education has a significant amount of English sleeping in them. They don't want to use it or, or scared to use it. It's either the um, pronunciation or the, or the right um, missing the, some vocabulary or grammar. Uh, whatever it may be, they tend not to bring it out. This course is designed <coughs> to just make you talk. We don't care about your accent. We say it's actually sexy and keep it. Um, we don't care about if you're uh, make, uh, creating grammatically correct sentences. We want you to just bring out your ideas and exchange them and have a discussion. Um, and foundations was the other class I mentioned, which is for beginners. If the immersive is too, too steep for coming. <coughs> Coming to the foundation, it's a part-time program, it's only a month, it takes absolute beginners, but still challenges you to think logically. Like I said, we do a lot of events. Uh, <coughs> we really enjoy this part of our job and lives. Uh, these are some of the upcoming events. One is happening tomorrow, uh, and, and so on and so forth, all the way until November. Anything any you want to specifically point out here? <coughs> <laughs> Miniconf, and I think even this, so Miniconf is a, a, a conference that we have, there's too many big, big conferences with big stars coming, with big money to be paid to enter, we want to attend a conference which is 15 minutes a speaker, and about 3 or 4 or 5 of them at, on the same day, um, and, and normal engineers who are not rock stars, some of them are, but you don't have to be, you would love to see if you guys want to come and, and just talk at one of our next mini conferences. And uh, I know Jan, you lost your voice, but on Monday we are talk, uh, Jan's talking at Kivato uh, and, and, and talking about, um, I can't I can't introduce this one very well. So, um, so oh, that's painful. Uh, so it's uh, how to get promoted. Um, so it's, it's mostly targeting uh, women um, because I think a lot of women struggle with uh, how to align and how to get noticed uh, by uh, their managers. Um, so it's really focused on, on that. Um, and I should stop talking. All right, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry I made you do that. All right, and I think that's the last slide we have. Please come and talk to us. Please join us. The way you can support us is by liking us on one of these social thingies uh, and saying something about us. We'd appreciate that very much. So without much further delay, we also want to introduce IOST um, for sponsoring the pizza and beer. Um, and they're a really cool blockchain company and I'll let uh, Kai introduce. Hi, uh, this is the first time we're introducing about blockchain, our company, so please do not give me any deeper question about book. I just joined, so I don't, I'm not a tech person, I'm just a community manager. So just give it a short introduction. Uh, so uh, it's called IOC. So IOC is a blockchain system project. Um, the headquarters is in Singapore. 
And uh, we, of course, the blockchain, so we're helping to create in the uh, scalability and uh, non-binary uh, uh, ecosystem. And uh, yeah, uh, and we, and we, uh, that's the project had started 2016. And in Japan, uh, the project came this June, so it's just about four months. Uh, and uh, we are really um, strong for the security, scalability, decentralized economy. Um, so our team, um, this team, uh, uh, the engineer team, we have 20 engineers in the globally. And uh, most of the people are from Harvard, Princeton, Brown, the big universities, and uh, people from Uber, Google, and most of all the very famous companies. Um, oops, can you look at that? Please, thank you. So Jimmy is the CEO. He started the uh, company when he was 19 years old. That was uh, his first company. And now uh, he started this IRSD project 2016. And Terry Terrence, he used to work at the uh, Microsoft and Uber as an engineer. And uh, we are going to explain, Bob, that you have a chance of talking to Terry uh, by AMA in this month. So if you have uh, if you have an int interest in blockchain and IRC our program, uh, please uh, join the AMA meetup. And uh, so the other group of team, uh, including like me, committee manager, and uh, business sales people, we have about uh, 50 people, but uh, maybe. I'm not, not sure, but it may be growing. So maybe it's going to up to 80 people. On, oops. And our team in Japan, <coughs> just three, including me, and the rest of the team is on the back. Two guys, and I'm me. So if you have any tech question about the IOC blockchain, please ask them, not to me. Okay. <laughs> um, and in our office, so we have in Seoul, and Beijing, Berlin, and globally, San Francisco. And uh, so we, we have we already uh, uh, accelerated into the, the next project. It's like a payroll system. Um, they help in the MMB, working with the uh, national universities in Japan, and the AI discussion support system. Also, this to the national tech university in Japan, and also for the workshop together like this event. We are help supporting the uh, this kind of the. Um, engineers uh, events uh, like uh, we work with the uh, university tech universities um, for the uh, deeper understanding in blockchain system and uh, I think this will be really interesting for you we are a we are partnered with the mantra I mean not many people have heard about that but um, uh, mantra is uh, working for the buy one give one um, and um, they uh, they have that that is the mission and uh, providing the uh, uh, sun sunglasses as uh, based on the uh, donation and uh, we support them as a tech system so that they can um, provide the um, the just more uh, transparent charity system with our support. Yep. And uh, this is the, our website. If you read the QR code from here, you can connect it to the, uh, the our website. And if you let register your information, you can get the uh, all the information about IOSD constantly. And please follow our Facebook and Twitter. And we also have a, a community, especially for the developers. And, uh, and another one is uh, developers one-stop site. So uh, we are a uh, blockchain uh, infra system. So we want more engineers has interest in our system. So if you have any question, if you want to discuss with other engineers about the IOSD, uh, please share uh, the ideas on those websites. So uh, meetup information. We're going to have a meetup 19th October. Um, at the Blink. Blink is a co-working office pretty close to here. And uh, you can ask any question to RCC <coughs> Terry 
He is based in Beijing, but you can, we can connect it on the uh, conference call. So yeah, please join us. You can read the QR code. Oh, sorry. You can read the QR code there and connect to the meetup page. <coughs> sorry. Yep. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Cool. Great. Today it's partly run by solar power, so I'm a little bit nervous. <coughs> see how far it will go. Um, my name is Pio. Um, I'm originally from Sweden, uh, where I'm born and raised, but I've lived in Japan for 25, more than 25 years. Um, I am very, very, very excited to be here tonight, because I've had more than 400 lectures, almost all of them in Japanese, about sustainability during the last 20 years here in Japan, very few in English, and never ever towards anyone with engineering, computing, coding background. So I'm totally, I'm totally amazed about this, this, this gathering and what, what will happen, because I think things will actually happen from this thing. Uh, how many people here tonight have heard about the SDGs before this event? Okay. And how many here have the confidence to be, be able to explain me what sustainability is in one sentence? <laughs> okay, one, two, fantastic. Um, don't ask me about coding, <laughs> I have no idea yet, but I feel it's very exciting. And I think that sustainability is something that we cannot avoid. And that will be a very, very interesting thing for you guys in the very, very close future, maybe already from tomorrow. So, um, I'm from One Planet Cafe LTD. It's a company we established in 2012 to try to change the world uh, by providing sustainability in reality. So, su sustainability in reality means that not only talking but actually doing. And uh, our CEO is here tonight as well, uh, Satoko, um, born and raised in Japan, also my beautiful wife. And, uh, we are working towards sustainability and reality in Sweden, Japan, developed countries, right? So-called developed. Uh, Zambia, in Africa, where we have a green factory we have built, run by solar, part, uh, partly. Um, so that is a developing nation. And then we also work towards India, emerging countries. So we are working with SDGs and sustainability in three, four different places at the same time. Uh, in Zambia, we are making uh, banana paper. Um, you heard right, banana paper. It's paper made from organic bananas. Um, maybe you know Lush. Lush is a quite famous company. It's one of our biggest clients. We're making sustainable packaging made from bananas. Eatable, maybe. <laughs> um, so we are developing a sustainable paper. So that is one thing of sustainability in reality. Another thing is we are doing sustainability tours to Sweden where we visit good examples, and Zambia, and these kind of lectures as well. So, I'm originally a journalist, so I've been working in uh, many countries, been visiting about 70 countries, 70. <coughs> and when I started out as a teenager, long, long time ago as a journalist, I went to a country and I saw a lot of environmental problems. Then I went to another country and I saw the solutions to that country's problems. But between themselves, they had no idea about those solutions. And also, at the same time, journalists didn't write about it. And one journalist told me in Sweden at that time, like, Pio, you have to remember one thing. Bad news sells. Good news doesn't sell. I can take an example, Zambia. Uh, when did you hear about Zambia last time in the news? Almost never, I think. Because there's no, no bad things happening. Almost. There's no fighting, they haven't had a war for 50 years, etc. Good news doesn't sell. So at that time, when I was a teenager, I decided to become an optimistic journalist. I wanted to provide the problems, but also the solutions, and see how far that could take me. And then I became an optimistic environmental consultant. And now I'm a sustainability producer. Okay? So maybe new words for all of you, but after this, probably 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes, I'm sure you can explain what sustainability is in one sentence. 
So, talking about going to a country, seeing the solutions is there. We have all the solutions for all the problems in the world, when it comes to environmental problems at least. Seeing that, that gives hope. And hope is what we need right now, especially in these kind of political times. I believe very strongly in, in, in the hope. And one of those hopes is SDGs. Um, by 2030, we will have solved, the human race will have solved poverty. It's not about reducing poverty, it's like solving poverty. We will have solved the gender inequality. We will have created communities, both in the countryside and in the cities, that are sustainable. We will have stopped the climate change. And we will have created peace. What do you think when you hear that? By 2030, how many years is that? 12 years. Good luck. <laughs> 12 years. This is the problems we are facing as human race right now. But imagine the entire world, almost the entire world, almost all countries on this planet have signed an agreement to solve this by 2030. And we did that in 2015. So we had a span of 15 years. And if I'm not wrong, I think we have about 7,000 languages on this planet, 4,000 religions, 200 countries. A lot of wives and husbands quarreling at night. Still, we could come together and create a shared value saying we will solve those problems by 2030. It's amazingly positive. So today I will talk about the background to this one. Why is this important? How did this happen? And the basic principles of sustainability. And those basic principles are like, like the basic principles of, for example, uh, sports, where you have rules. Or like uh, cooking, where you cook. We call those, those rules uh, recipes, I think, right? Um, if I want to make a, a pizza, I don't gather strawberries and bananas, because then it will become a cake. And if you know the rules, the recipes, it's quite easy after a while if you put effort into it to, to, to learn how to cook. But if you don't know, it's the same with the coding. Coding, I learned from uh, Mr. Kani the other day, is basically a way to tell a machine what to do. So if you don't have your machine, machine, it doesn't matter how much you want to tell something to happen. You need the machine, right? Isn't it? Am I wrong? For coding, that is a basic thing, right? So. That is what I'm going to, to, to talk about tonight. So th there are some exa examples uh, in the end as well. So there's quite basic, uh, kind of boring basic that I will talk about. But if you get that, you can apply it to coding, you can apply it to your daily life, you can apply it anywhere. Those principles are based on the laws of nature, so they don't change. It's very exciting. So let's begin with our place. Um, there's a lot of people here today I, I, from different countries, I guess. And I feel that's very, very exciting. Uh, and this is our home, right? And looking at it from space, it always amazes me that we are the only species out of... How many species on this planet? How many species are there? Hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. That's very close. Very good. <laughs> Minimum of five million. But no one knows for sure. It might be the three times as much. But let's say we have five million species on this planet. We are the only one looking through space that needs a passport to cross the border. No one else needs that, right? Which is quite crazy, I think, in one way. Um, so that is the Earth we have today. Uh, another question. How old is this? How old is our home? Four billion. Four? Billion. Four billion years, yes. It's everything from four billion to five billion to 4.6 billion. No one knows maybe exactly for sure, but approximately, let's say, 4 billion years. Now, uh, can anyone here explain how, how much that is? How much is 4 billion? You do code coding, so you should be able to do the mathematics, yeah? How, how much is 4 billion? It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> I think that is the best answer I've had in a long time. Very good, it's a lot. 4 billion, or usually we say 4.6 billion. So if you imagine the Earth being born 4.6 billion years ago, and we are here today at this time, and you imagine a rope, we make a rope, okay? 
that is 4.6 meters. Get it? Okay? Then the animals and plants, now I'm simplifying it, but the animals and plants appeared somewhere one meter ago on this road. We are here, right? It was born here, the, the earth. And we, the human beings, the modern human, for the last hundred or two hundred thousand years, the modern human, has existed only for the last one millimeter. So we are very, very much beginners. Still we are messing up this planet. So messing up the planet means we are making something called in Japanese, jizoku fukano nasekai, non-sustainable world. And I will explain a little bit what is happening most of you know it already. Right now we have 7.6 billion people on this planet and we are all together using 1.7 planets to satisfy our lifestyle or our business. You understand that? It means we are taking more from nature than nature can recover. So we are using it in a higher speed than it recover. So we are not giving uh, nature enough uh, time and space to recover. For example, we are using a tree that takes 30 years to grow. We cut it, we make a table. We use it for 10 years, throw it away, we go to nature and we use another tree. So the nature has no time to recover. So we're using 1.7 planets. And one of the results is that from the 1970s, or 1970 exactly, our world population has doubled. At the same time, from the 1970, the amount of animals, not the species, the amount of animals have halved, down by 50%. Okay, so population up, doubled, the amount of animals down. This is a non-sustainable uh, world. Uh, we have deforestation, uh, we're losing a forest as big as almost one-third of Japan every year, um, according to NASA. We have a garbage waste problem. We are now throwing away in Japan, if you live in Japan, on average about 300 kilos of waste per year per person. Endangered species. Uh, according to some reports, we are losing approximately 50 species of living things on this planet every single day. So just during my speech here, maybe we're losing one or two, two, two species. It's, it's an amazing uh, mass extinction happening. And then of course we have the global warming and you know what is happening with the storms, the floods, etc. I mean, people don't need to tell us this anymore. <coughs> and then of course we have poverty. Um, see, between 600 million and uh, 1 billion people are suffering from poverty, extreme poverty, which means living less than $1.9 a day. So th this is the non-sustainable world we have right now. And there are two solutions that are happening. The human solution and nature solution. And the human solution started 46 years ago, 1972, in Stockholm, in uh, the capital of uh, Sweden, where I'm from, where something called Earth Summit appeared. It was the first time ever that politicians came together in such a big meeting recognizing that there is actually existing something called environmental problems. Until then, people didn't think like garbage is a big problem, global warming, no, not really, etc. But this was the first time, 1972. <coughs> Olympics or uh, soccer, football, uh, World Cups is happening every fourth year. The Earth Summit is basically happening every 10 years. And what is happening here is that they put all the problems we are facing on this planet as humans together on one table and trying to solve it. So in 1972, the first Earth Summit happened in Sweden. 1992 in Brazil, 2002 in South Africa. This photo is from South Africa. And I was actually participating there as well. And then a lot of businesses, uh, a lot of computer people, a lot of uh, housewives, a lot of uh, university students, a lot of governments are gathering there. Uh, this is actually the indigenous people's meeting. And you also have children's meeting there. Um, and 2012 in Brazil, there was another one. 
So this is the history of, of humans, how they try to solve the problems we are facing. And 46 years of human history when it comes to sustainability, and I will take it down to just one minute and explain what the vision has come out, the outcome of these meetings for 46 years. One of the biggest things that came out was that we had a common a consensus of what sustainability is. And here you get the sustainability explanation in one sentence. Um, the UN definition of sustainability is the balance between three pillars. Human, human health, nature, environment, eco, and what we all aim for, I think, profits, economy. We understood after a while in the 70s, 80s, that we cannot go out and hug trees and stand there in the forest hugging trees. Because after a while you get hungry. If you don't eat, you get, you know, you catch a cold or something. And if you want to eat, you need food. And if you need food, you need money. You have to work. So it's not enough only to, you know, protect the environment. So here, the expression people, planet, profit. Okay. So whatever you do at home, whatever you do in coding, should be balanced on this if you reach for sustainability. It's not only about the environment, it's about health and economy. After a while, people started to think like, okay, that's fine. People plan profit. I get it, you know. For example, I go by bicycle, that's healthy. But it also reduces CO2, which is good for environment, and I save money. But until when should we do what? There's no time, time frame, there's no time schedule. So people started to criticize and people started to, to, to have a lot of controversy and, and, and they saw a hope in having a kind of schedule. So they made the sustainable development goals. So sustainability and all the problems we are facing might look very complex and, and, and it's, it's poverty here, it's health problems here, it's, 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 it's gender inequality here, and it's, it's uh, HBTQ uh, uh, problems here, or it's like a waste problem here, global warming. There's a lot of pieces. But they, for the first time in history, we have, in 2015, we have put all those pieces together into a time frame. And that is that by 2030, we should solve all those problems. Very optimistic, but a very great possibility. And economically, if you think about no poverty, okay, that sounds fine, but there's no money in it for me. If you think that 600 million people, up to, up to 1 billion people, can get out from extreme poverty up to maybe, for example, middle class, come up to a certain level, then that creates a new fantastic market for everyone. Also, you could do something called BUP business, bottom of pyramid business, which means that you're helping people in extreme poverty by creating an employment through, for example, computer or mobile phones or coding, etc. And uh, we are working in Zambia. And in Zambia, actually, we're very surprised, but fa faster than in Japan, they started with mobile banking. You know, so women are going with 20 liters of water on their head. You know, they have no rimming water and doing mobile banking. It's a fantastic world right now. And there, coding, apps, etc., has an amazing future, I think. SDGs. Sustainable Development Goals. Do you know also, that's another word for this one that we're using in daily, daily language. Do you know that one? Sustainable Development Goals? Yeah. The, the goals set by the UN? Yeah. And to reach sustainability? Yeah. By 2030? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Very good. Uh, there is a, there's a, there's a, how to say, there's a daily, daily kind of an expression, daily life expression that we use. SDGs is very much used here in Japan, but globally we call it globally we call it global goals. Global goals. Actually, this design is quite interesting because for the first time, sustainability has been a kind of a visibility in Japanese mieruka. And to make sustainability visible is a very, very hard thing to do. 
And I'll come to that later. And there, I think, codings and apps and so on has a very important role to play to create visibility for sustainability. But for the first time, what do you think when you see this design? Is it easy to understand or hard to understand or complex or? First of all, look, look here. We have no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality. Here you have the health pillar, right? And then you go down to the economical pillar. Decent work and economical growth, healthy economical growth. This is your piece, particularly. Innovation, this is very important. Reducing inequality, <coughs> sustainable, etc. Responsible consumption and production. This is about fair trade, environmental label products, <coughs> services, global warming. So from here, life below water, life on land, protecting animals, endangered species like elephant, giraffe, both endangered species. Um, this is the environmental pillar, right? And then we have peace. And then the 17th one is partnership that we should partnership, do create partnership and collaboration to reach those goals. So actually 16 goals plus the 17. But when you read it, is it difficult to understand? It's quite easy, isn't it? it actually, it's the Swedish designer who created this. Um, in Sweden, we have something called participation, or I call it participation communication. It's a very interesting communication where you try to ask people to participate. We don't put a sign maybe on the wall saying, please save energy, switch off the light. Instead, maybe we put up a sign that says, if you switch off the light, we get a brighter future. So, oh, then it's something we need for me, right? So that's how this uh, was uh, come, uh, come, come up. So this is a visibility of, of sustainability. It's a promise. Don't forget this. This is not only something on, on, on the table. This is a, actually a promise. There's a global ranking for sustainability. Um, we call it the SDGs index. So for each of those 16 goals, there is a kind of point system. So you get points. How gender equality are you? How many women are in your government? How many women are on your board? in your company, right? For example, how many CO2, how many kilos of CO2 per person are you emitting? How much garbage, how much waste per person? There's a lot of point systems and there are 169 targets to reach those things. And you get a point for each one. And Sweden is uh, currently, actually th th three years consecutive number one on this ranking. And Sweden has a lot of good examples that you ought to uh, imitate and just introduce, I think. China 54, Germany 4, USA 35, India 112, etc. This is only the first part, that's another part. So if you didn't find your country here on this one, be, be worried, yeah? be worried. It should be more lower down. Sweden's vision is to be sustainable by 2021. We decided this already in the 1990s, before the SDGs. Um, so we will omit the majority of the economical, health, and environmental problem by 2021. This is kind of symbolic year, but this is something we decided in 1996, which is 25 years, one generation. Look at the waste, the recycle rate in Sweden is 99%. It means like, Everything you're throwing away in your home, if you think about that in one week or one month, only 1% is coming on the landfill. 99% is recycled or reused at least once. CO2, the global warming CO2, you know about this. Um, there's a promise called Kyoto Protocol. And also now we call it the Paris uh, Agreement. And we should reduce CO2, right? Sweden has been able to reduce CO2 from 1990s when the Kyoto promise was made from 1990 to 2016 have reduced it by 26%. At the same time, the economy is growing by 2 to 3% every year. So this is a very, very unusual situation in the world that the waste is going down, the CO2s are going down, the economy is going up. And this is because one reason is that you try to 
not take more from nature than we give back. If you go back to the 1.7 planets, we try to live within one planet. We are far away from it still, both in Sweden and other countries, but if we can live within one planet, we can develop sustainably without losing comfortability. <coughs> This is a very interesting uh, graph. Uh, CO2 emissions, according to World Bank. Uh, 1960s, here on the left side. And 2010, quite recent, here on the right side. Uh, the CO2 emissions, global warming emissions, in most countries have gone like Japan, on this orange line here. It has gone up, 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 according to the economic development, and then it, here it's just flattened out and still kind of rising, and they are struggling, not only Japan, but other countries as well, struggling to, to, to lower the CO2s. Sweden did the opposite. They, they, they were very high in the beginning, 12 tons per person per year, and now they're just going down, down, down all the time. And this is the economical growth, GDP per capita. So here the blue line, Swedish <coughs> GDP has increased more than the Japanese one. One more time. CO2 down, economy up. Which means that it's possible to protect environment, helping people, and still have an economical growth. This is the only graph I'm going to show you tonight because I, I, I don't like graphs very much. I like clear pictures instead. Disability. Who do you think this is? A guess, take a guess. Swedish government. Perfect, Swedish government. Um, thinking about the gender equality, half are women. Um, this is Swedish government. And they have gone out quite early on to say that we will be a leader of the world when it comes to sustainability. We will be an environmental good example. Who are these? <laughs> this is what is happening in the world today, right? Um, not only the US, but some other countries too, are like going in, in an opposite kind of non-sustainable direction, right? Signing, signing different laws and so on that maybe not everyone is agreeing on. Um, so the Swedish deputy minister, the vice minister, uh, she is a she, um, she took the opportunity after this photo, uh, no relations, she, she said, <laughs> and she gathered not only men here, but only women. And she signed into to a kind of regulation, right, a law, that we will reduce CO2 by 100%. That's one zero zero, 100% by 2045. Can you reduce CO2 by 100%? Is that possible? Think of it. 100% by 2045. So there is a hope, and uh, it is possible to reduce CO2, it's possible to reduce uh, garbage, etc. This is a global uh, competitiveness index. Uh, Sweden is quite high. United States number three, for example, Sweden number six. So why I show this often is because a lot of people think it's kind of prejudice, like eco and environmental activity means loss of uh, comfortability. Uh, economical profit. It's the opposite if you do that the right thing. Then the last part. This is the last of my three parts. We are coming to the last part. Is that in Sweden we discovered something in the 90, late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, we discovered what is a little bit exaggerated, but it was discovered that nature has its own roots. Think of it. Uh, how many species on the planet now? How many? Yeah, yeah. At least five million, right? Good. Testing. <laughs> um, when I thought about this the first time, I, I had a wake up call. Like, <clears throat> how many of those species are actually creating waste? It's only you, right? You and me. It's only humans. We are the only ones that create waste. Think of it. In nature, there's no waste. Everything is a resource. The leaf falls down to the ground, goes into the ground. There's a nourishment. 
then it's recycled into a flower, the flower dies, goes into soil again, you recycle and it's a tree. So you have the, the leaf into to, 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 to soil, one time recycle. Then soil to flower, two times recycling. And, and there's no loss of energy, no loss of, 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 of waste or anything. Um, we are the only species on this planet who digs a big hole in the ground, digging up below ground fossil energy. Everyone else has sold it already. The flower grows up thanks to solar power, right? The elephant is walking tens of kilometers every day eating grass, that's biomass, right? And the bird and the butterfly is using the wind, wind power to, to, to move. And they have figured out how to do it already. And there's hardly any unemployment in nature, right? I think the last, according to the last statistics, the, the unemployment rate in nature is 0%. I mean, you've never seen an unemployed uh, bird or, 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 or ant or something like that, right? <laughs> they are very busy. So, we should start to invite the nature into our decisions. To learn from them. Maybe they have a rule or something. Maybe they, they, they did something one meter ago, you know, before we were even born on this planet. Something that we should learn from. And in Sweden, they found that. They found that the ant, the elephant, the tree, the flower, the butterfly has created special rules that we haven't noticed yet. And they took these rules, the scientists, and they made it into a sentence. And those rules are the environmental rules or the principles, the basic principles for sustainability. Rule number one, don't take more from nature than you give back. One planet. Right? <coughs> Rule number two, below ground, above ground. Or actually it says like more like use only resources from above ground. I'll talk about this in a minute. And rule number three, and this is the engine of the entire eco-cycle, ecosystem here on, on, on Earth, it's to conserve biodiversity. The animals and plants is the engine of everything. I can talk about this for three weeks, and I don't have too much time, so I'll talk only about the two rules above here. The first one is a little bit complicated, the second one is easy, and then some examples, and then we go into to Q&A. Rule number one, don't take more from uh, nature than you give back. It's a very simple one, everyone has learned this at school, I'm sure. Uh, this is the eco cycle, actually this is based on an <coughs> illustration that is a, a, an education tool for not children, but for adults and for, for employees in Sweden. So. Look at this green cycle. This is the eco cycle or bio cycle. Now, ignore it because that's what we have done for the last 200,000 years. So let's ignore this one and let's only concentrate on the middle one here. This is the technical cycle, this red cycle. This is our society. So what is happening here, sorry if I repeat a lot of things because a lot of you know this, it's very simple. But we have nature, right? Or resources like oil and trees and so on. We take too much, more than it can recover. We have learned that, right, from the first slide. We send it into the society to a factory where we add chemicals and we add fossil fuel energy. So there's a lot of pollution coming out both here and there. But the clients are happy. Look, they are smiling here. A new smartphone, a new, new computer, a new t-shirt, a new house, a new car. And then after we have used it, we throw it away here. So what is happening is that less and less resources, more and more garbage. This is called the linear society, the one-way society. And that is what we have lived according for the last 150, 200 years. Okay? Now, how did nature solve this? Well, nature already like, you know, one meter ago or something, um, they have another cycle called the biocycle. So what they do is that, from here, sorry, I go into the slide, because I feel excited about this one. Um, so they don't take more from nature than they give back. Even lions in Africa, they never eat more impalas than they need. And if they do, hyenas coming and eating the rest, and the vultures, and then there's nothing left. It's magic, perfect recycle system. So they don't take more from nature than they give back, and then they eat it, they get energy, they die, but since there's no chemicals, they return to soil, one part of it, and they become 
nourishment and energy again for new resources to go, grow back. This is the eco cycle system. And the, the economy based on this one is called the circular economy. How many of you have heard that word, circular economy? Yes. That is to include the cycles here. So if we humans are doing the same, so we are obeying by the same rules, we don't take more from nature than we give back, we do the same process all over again, but according to nature, we send the resources into the factories, we don't add fossil energy, we run it by solar or wind power, right? Just like the birds and, and, and elephants and so on. And we, we add no chemicals, so it's organic, okay? No pollution, perfect. Then the clients are happy. We have a new smartphone made from bamboo, yeah? Or a new car where the entire car is made from hemp, it exists, or run by ear, it exists, okay? Or a t-shirt made from organic cotton. Then, after using it, we don't throw it away, we send it back to society, we reuse it or recycle it. But, it doesn't matter how many times you recycle or reuse anything, in the end of the day, it will be shattered. A paper, for example, can only be recycled up to five times. Then the fibers are so shattered, you can't do a good recycled paper anymore. But don't worry, the bamboo smartphone is made without chemicals, so it returns the soil into energy, and we have a biocycle based smartphone. So those two cycles are the things that uh, come into this uh, principle. The biocycle, everything has to be returned to nature, and technical cycle where we just try to recycle things. How many people here have heard about reduce, reuse, recycle? Can you? Okay, but there's one missing. Reduce, reuse, recycle is here. Here is R, R, re, 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 return. Reduce, reuse, recycle, return. This one, the eco cycle, is now compulsory education in Swedish schools. Before you graduate uh, uh, junior high school, you have to know this. In the companies, or many companies, they learn that this as an uh, employee education. And even the government have included it in Kotlin in the law. We have to create an eco cycle society. Couple more minutes. This is the second rule, this is the easiest one. Therefore, I always put it here last because people are starting to get you know, a lot of information. This is called chika chijo in Japanese. Above ground and below ground. This is the easiest. During my 400 plus lectures so far, people have always, or usually they say that this is the easiest one that they could apply immediately. This is the Earth. We can divide Earth into two parts. Above ground, resources, human, trees, flowers, etc. And below ground, for example, oil. As long as we take not more from nature than we give back, rule number one, and apply this one, and use only resources from above ground, CO2 from our mouth, for example, CO2, will come out, uh, there will be garbage, but since this is one part of the eco cycle, the bio cycle, it can return to soil, it returns into nature, there is no problems. This is the solution. The problem we have today is that we dig this big long hole in the ground, we take up millions of year old oil, and we make what? Petroleum. Yeah, petroleum, energy, electricity, plastic, right? And that one, creates garbage, the same garbage as from above ground, the same CO2, but the difference is that this CO2 was not on the above ground from the beginning. So, according to the laws of nature, they don't belong to each other. We are messing up. So this CO2 plus this CO2, now you have a problem. So as long as we can change from below ground to above ground, we have the solution. We're on the right track. So now, you, you I saw CO2 coming out from your mouth. Is that above ground, you know? Above, yes. So we can all laugh, we can all scream, we can all talk. It doesn't affect global warming. This is not environmentally friendly. 
This is environmentally correct because our rules decided by nature, by the animals, by the ecocycle. We cannot argue against this. Laws of nature or nature never lies. Pen. What kind of pen do you have? Do you have a pen? Coding people don't have pen. <laughs> okay, do you have any kind? Oh, okay, you have a pen. Well, what is it made of? <coughs> plastic. Where does plastic come from? Oil. Where is oil from? Below ground or above ground? Below ground. So this is not environmentally correct. It's non-sustainable because, sorry, not criticism towards you, <laughs> but oil takes millions of years to create. You have to use this pen now for another million years to be able to have new oil again. It's maybe two million years old. This is educational speaking, so it's only symbolic. But let's say it takes one million years to create oil. You make a plastic pen. You have to recycle it for another million years so that new oil can be created. So we have a two million old cycle. This pen is made from bananas. We create that banana paper. And it's very, very dirty if you see it later because I've used it for nearly a year. But a year means that the new banana will shoot up because it takes only one year to grow. So now we have created a cycle that is two million years old to one, one year. This is a sustainable pen. This is a renewable pen. So when things can recover, it's called renewable. That's why we call it renewable energy, right? Because it can always recover more than we take. Bamboo, fantastic. Bamboo, one year. Uh, paper, 30 years, 10 to 30 years. But if you mix banana into it, it's much shorter, right? So this is a paper bag we have created for lush, um, made from partly banana and recycled paper, the rest. Uh, so these kind of things uh, is very possible to do. Okay, wind, wind, wind power is below ground, above ground? Above. Uh, how about, uh, ah, this is a tricky one, natural gas. Natural gas. Below, it's not natural. It's a fossil fuel gas. How about making gas from above ground? It's possible. It's called biogas. So every time you hear biogas, biogasoline, bio something, bioplastic, it means above ground plastic, above ground gas. It goes into the ecocycle. Uh, by the way, this is our um, solar powered, 100% solar powered office in Zambia. Uh, very nearby goes uh, elephants and giraffes, and we have had buffalo visiting the place, we have had a uh, hippo, uh, we had a hyena recently. It's a very amazing place, run by solar. Solar is a background, right? Who remembers this? Back to the future. Back to the future. Doc is coming back. And he's surprising these guys. He says, like, in the future, we run cars and garbage. Bullshit. Tomotara. If you think so, it's not bullshit. It's sustainability in reality. This is my home city of Malmo. In Malmo, third largest city in Sweden, all buses, all buses are run on non-fossil fuel, non-below-ground fuels. We have changed it from below ground to above ground. So what it is, is that we gather coffee waste, banana peels, and if you have one kilo of organic waste, or food waste, you can run a car or a bus two kilometers. It's possible, it's happening. And the CO2 that comes out is above ground, below ground? Above. above. So it's okay. So the Paris Agreement, the Kyoto Protocol, doesn't include those above ground. It's about, about the below, below ground. Amazing, huh? Um, this is happening. Uh, this is a food waste uh, thing in uh, Sweden, where uh, a lady, CEO, has, uh, she, she created a, a company that's really interesting. Food waste is a big uh, thing. And I'm coming to uh, an example with a, uh, with an apple in, in, in one or two minutes here. I don't have too much time. But uh, she gathered bad fruit from the <coughs> shops. She cut away the bad parts from the supermarket, from the apples. She squeezed it, she made a, a apple juice, and it's called the rescued fruits. Uh, so this is a business idea that come out from, 
from these kind of uh, principles, right? Here it says, Red Dabba Mot Me Karma. Save our food with karma. And here, for a couple of minutes, before we end, I want you to, to explain about this. Okay, so this is the app uh, to solve, uh, was developed to, to solve the food loss. So, so this is the, the application, using application, uh, it connects restaurants or supermarkets or shops and uh, consumers. So consumer can get those uh, information and then buy online. So, so the shops uh, or restaurants don't need to take any uh, risks to, to leave uh, the food, waste food, um, until uh, at the end or by the end. So, so this is the, the application and it's already, uh, it started in 2016 and uh, it's already 350,000 restaurants and shops and supermarkets introduced. And uh, also many uh, consumers are uh, uh, registered. In Sweden, yeah. yeah so it's very, uh, this is one, one example of what you can do, coding and so on, right? Yes. So let me have the last slide. Uh, we live in a sustainable mansion, a uh, sustainable apartment in uh, Tokyo. And here's my last picture. It's a little bit strange one. Uh, it's me with a football. And this is my one month garbage. This is how much waste um, I am on average uh, throwing away per month. Uh, this is more than the average Swede, because in Sweden it's even less, believe it or not. Based on the eco cycle, based on the principle, it's very possible to do even in Japan. Before we did that, there was not so much about it, but since we put this picture out, or this kind of picture out, a uh, publisher contacted us and we wrote our first Japanese book, a guidebook for ecological lifestyle. This was 10 years ago. And what I realized at that point was that if you can make visibility, until now there was no visibility, we just said garbage, we have to reduce. But if you can make, for example, an app, application an app, that visualize CO2 or endangered species, or the eco cycle, or food loss, or garbage, we're on the right track to change the world. And it could start with very small steps, but I think with your ideas, we can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you leave that slide uh, with the 14 uh, SDGs? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so now that we are educated and armed with some information, let's do something interesting. We're going to uh, ask you to self-organize into teams of, say, uh, I'll say eight, 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 eight. So take a moment to do that, and I'll explain what you're going to do. Uh, we're going to have you guys each pick your favorite three SDGs that you want to solve on your own. And then, within the team, Take a consensus of what you have and pick one. And the next 15 minutes after that, we're going to ask you to think about how you would solve that with technology. You don't have to be a coder. You don't have to figure out how to write the application or the product or uh, thing that you want to create. But just, just try to t work, talk to your team and see how you would use technology to solve it. And then we're going to have one representative from each team, less than two minutes, Come up here and do some presentations as to what you think your, you know, how you're going to tackle the problem. Ready? Yes, go ahead. We're going to have time for a Q&A. Absolutely. Oh, you want to do the Q&A right now? And maybe then go. Yes, you want to do the Q&A right now? No, I'll just, I'll just it might help the exercise, so let's do Q&A uh, 10 minutes right now. Yeah, okay. okay. You stop me. I can talk for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so please, yes. I want to eat your questions. Yes. Um, Okay, so obviously Sweden's doing like a lot in terms of innovation. Um, I'm American. We're not really trending in the right direction right now. Uh, I mean, between leaving the Paris Accords and investing in fossil fuels, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yes. So my question you know, to you is more as innovators, or because that's, that's what I think developers are, engineers are, where does uh, sustainability begin? 
be a top or just be a bottom? I, th I, th I think I think it's both ways. You have, you, but in Swedish, in Swedish example, if we take a sample from Sweden, it's again with people getting furious uh, because in the 1970s we had uh, development, non-sustainable development. We, we were cutting down trees. We were tra trying to transform uh, parks, old parks, to, to, to subway lines and, and streets, and people didn't like that. So the young people are raised up, and they had a, a kind of environmental uh, uh, revolution, if you, if you say. And, and then they started to create an environmental party, the Green Party. And the party came into the parliament and made, in a long story very short, uh, it put pressure on the other parties to make, uh, make something. And then we changed uh, and, and uh, created uh, environmental objectives uh, that is included or integrated into the laws. So, I, th I think it depends on, you know, in some countries, you go to China, for example. In China, it's, it's more like from top, right? They say, like, from today, we will no, not use any plastic bags anymore. And then it's, it's done, right? So I think it depends on, on the situation and what you want to do. And so on. But I think, like, if you start something, you will see a kind of chain reaction. And this is, has happened to me a lot of times. I, I've done this for 30 years, and, and, or nearly 30 years. And, and always there's so many things, positive things happening when you start something. And when you start something within sustainability, next problem will come, next problem will come, next problem will come, all the time. So the more you know, the more you don't know you feel sometimes, but you have some connections and people will pop up from nowhere helping you out. So I think you just have to do it, to use Nike's slogan. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, long, long explanation. You lived in Zambia? Yeah, but it was nice to see wow. the connection here. Fantastic. And um, we recently did an event on blockchain with SDG in Japan, specifically to try and highlight um, like how we can create a movement for social good from Japan and the rest of the world. Now, my question to you, because you have experience in Sweden, which is leading in this, Zambia where you have applications, and in Japan, mm. what are some, exa some examples of um, kind of tech-related companies or Mina Dendoku, yes, yes, you can, you can explain that. <coughs> Mina Dendoku is, is an energy company that has popped up um, that offers uh, green energy solutions. So you can actually choose green energy now in Japan. And uh, the, the for renewable energies, it's, it's one of the biggest challenges is that it's very difficult to, to see what kind of energy I am using, for example, for, for this iPhone. So, but now, thanks to the, the, the what you call it? the block blockchain 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 um, now you can see which uh, which for example wind power or solar solar energy or that that kind of you know energy source that you are using no yeah so you you can uh, I don't know how it works I'm not a tech person but uh, but uh, now you can see and you can choose too so it's it's very exciting. Isn't it? And then you can put on an email, for example, we, we, we do a wind power, we have done wind power for many years at our Tokyo apartment, 100%. So then uh, we, we send our emails and, and in the bottom, I don't know if you notice that, it says like, this email is sent by wind power. You know, and that adds a value to your email, <laughs> for example. So, so you can use it in many ways in that sense. But it's about visibility again, right? Yeah. So just to further that, there's a company that's been uh, established recently called Trendia, and they have uh, a service called Ashita Denki, mm -hmm. and they, for the consumer, it's just an energy retailer, so you can um, buy energy from this company as opposed to Tepco, and part of the energy that they provide is from renewable sources. Very good. So I there are several coming up now, Yeah. and as long as we are supporting that, um, it will spread. Um, that is what happened in Sweden, for example. So now we have uh, wind power, wind powered trains, uh, biomass powered uh, hotels, etc. It's really fun. You're going by wind powered train, you think like, oh, 
the whole thing, wind doesn't stop blowing, you know. But it's very, very interesting what is happening. It's creating this visibility. And this is very good information too. And so if you can connect, or maybe you can do an app visualizing it even more, because those companies are struggling to visualize. Visualization is very, or visibility is a very, very big challenge of something this kind of abstract. Some other? Thank you. I would like to ask about solar panels. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it is very renewable because if I remember well, we don't know yet how to recycle the solar panels. What, what do you think? <coughs> very good. You have come to next step. Ah, okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So why don't we use, for example, human energy? Um, in Sweden, for example, we have a, the central station of Stockholm. There are 200 to 300,000 people passing through every day. And in the winter, when it's 20 minus or 10 minus outside, those people are releasing heat, right? Uh, all of our body temperatures is between 35 and 37, depending on where you come from. And if you have, for example, a 36 degrees body temperature, that is quite nice temperature to be in in the cold winter, right? So what we have done is that we have been able to in a magic way, I say, uh, gather the body temperature from those 200,000 people passing through the station every day. We gather it and we heat a nearby office building by human energy. Humans are below ground and above ground? Problem solved. So that is next step. Or air cars, cars that runs on air, for example. Electrical cars are not really good if they are charged by fossil fuel. So it's the same thing. So it's just a step. It's just a step. I think, I think solar panels, now they're developing so quickly. There are even foldable uh, solar panels now. There are, there are, for example, I went to northern Sweden in, in January. It was minus 27. Still they use solar for an ice hotel. Ice hotel using solar panels, 27 degrees. So what they did is they put it not on the top, because the sun is really low in northern Sweden. It's very dark in the winter but they put it on the walls so that the reflection from the snow charging the batteries. So there you go again. And then if we make batteries, for example, if you take, and there is one uh, very interesting uh, example of a school that uh, talked about you know, bringing uh, eggs and bananas to school, they mashed it and they put an electrical meter inside and there was a reaction. So you can make a battery out of eggs and bananas, right? It's possible. Everything is possible. Everything has an energy. So it, we have to go to the next step. Yeah, wind power is very ugly, some people say. I think they're extremely beautiful. But this is just a step on the way. In the future, there will be no wind power anymore. We will find another way to, to create even better, more positive energy. Education is totally fundamental to all of this. Um, I think it underlines the achievement of these goals. Um, it underlines the theme of the content of your presentation and also the theme of this workshop. And without it, there's no way that um, we could have a better understanding about sustainability. Um, and I noticed that one of, the, your, one of the principal activities that you're involved in is organizing study tours to Sweden mm -hmm. um, as the Mm -hmm. the slogan of sustainability and reality. Um, so I was just wondering if you could talk more about kind of what sorts of activities do you do as a part of these study tours and how do you measure the effectiveness of um, these study tours after? Very good. So it's a very good question. Uh, so first of all, I, I believe in good examples. Uh, when you see a good example, all of a sudden the impossible become possible in that moment, right? People say, oh, that's muri, muri desu ne, toka. In Japanese, they always say, muri, muzukashi, taihen. It's so difficult to do this and that and this. But when you see a car running on banana peels, then you understand that it's possible all of a sudden. So that is what we go and see. We stay at environmentally friendly or environmentally correct hotels. For example, at one hotel chain in Sweden, it's the first eco-labeled hotel in the world, or eco-labeled hotel chain in the world. They've introduced 2,000 sustainability acti actions inside the hotel, 2,000, you know, reducing plastic bottles, that's one. Then you have 1,999 more. 
Um, we're staying at Green Energy Hotels. We are going by biogas, by this uh, banana peel and coffee waste taxis. Um, we are going by wind power trains. We are visiting uh, companies. Uh, we're visiting, for example, a coding um, called Y Waste. Uh, you can look it up, Y Waste. They have done a fantastic uh, app uh, also about food waste. Um, we are visiting, um, uh, how do you say it? Digitite, you know? Local governments, so local governments are visiting and see the policy from there, and we adjust usually to, 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 to the clients if we don't have a general tool. So for example, we have brought Honda, we have brought uh, Nissan, we have brought a different kind of uh, cow and so on, corporations, and tailor-made to their needs. For example, for, for environmentally friendly or environmentally correct uh, uh, detergents, etc. Et then we visit them. We visit NGOs, startups, startup hubs, etc., where sustainability is one part of, of, of the base. This is what we do. But the thing is that we do it holistically. So you stay, you live environmentally correct, you, you, you move, transport environmentally correct, you eat environmentally correct. If you want to, that is a difficult part. So you have a choice if you want to do a semi, uh, if you want to eat vegetarian or demeterian. You know demeterian. UN is, is, is saying that 14% of our global warming CO2s come from meat industry, right? And um, that's why I switched and became semi-vegetarian. But there's demeterian as well. Demeterian is when you don't want to give up your meat, but you can reduce it on your own lifestyle, in your own lifestyle, by half, 50%, one planet. That is called demeterian. It's a new word. So everyone can become a demeterian. Thank you. I guess you guys are ready? Yes. All right, let's do it. Uh, let's round of applause for Subasa and Dustin. Okay, guys. Um, hi, uh, I'm Subasa. Uh, this is Dustin. We also have a third team member uh, called Kimiko. She's not here with us today. Um, yeah. uh, let me just briefly introduce to you uh, our um, app. Um, so I have personal experience heading um, up to the Northeast region um, in responding to the uh, great uh, East Japan earthquake back in 2011. And I, I found the problem to be actually that uh, there, you know, there, there's plenty of people who are in need of help. Uh, but it was, it was a huge information problem of um, you know, who needed what kind of resources. We have this, you know, my team is able to provide help, but then um, we had significant difficulty in actually reaching people, um, although you know, there's, there's pl clearly plenty of people who need help. Um, also, one of our me team members was also a victim in a uh, hurricane um, in, her, in her childhood. So this was something that we were personally invested in, and so we, we thought uh, we could do something um, to, um, you know, help uh, bring people together um, in, in a salient manner in, in this disaster. And we thought we could do something in the form of an app using live tracking and sharing location information. So we went through a full uh, formal design process. We identified who the persona is. Uh, we created a scenario and then we broke that into user stories. And we uh, actually spent three weeks building an app. So let's just, let me just briefly show you what the app looks like today. So uh, let's say that an earthquake hits right now, and our community knows how to use this app. Um, as you can see, it seems like there's a fire going on uh, up in the, the uh, north, north of Coast Christmas. It seems like there's a fire that has been spreading westward, and people have already been pinning information onto this map. Um, yeah, OK, um, let's say I actually see a couple of uh, injured people down the street. Um, I can actually hold down on the map and then create a pin myself. And then I can put in that information. So the thing about our app is that all this information is, is public. So once I put that in, this information is shared real time to all of the users um, who are actually looking into this situation. Yeah, there you go. I can also see, of course, um, how many minutes ago this was created. What's more, you can also share information um, <coughs> regarding, um, well, you, you can draw information into the map. So for example, you, if you can draw evacuation routes, or you can even draw um, 
ingress routes for emergency vehicles so that they can actually respond and access the, the site. Since we're crowdsourcing disaster mapping, um, it's very important that you are able to improve the quality of the information as time progresses. And you can do that by doing things like um, adding comments and upvoting and downvoting. Um, and if there's a significant amount of downvotes, it's clearly you know, it's, it's false information or the situation is per, uh, no longer ongoing. And so uh, that pin can be automatically deleted. Um, and of course, you know, higher votes means that something is ongoing, that it, there's multiple eyewitnesses to the situation. What you can additionally do is uh, you can use your two fingers and swipe up. And then people who are less familiar with mapping, um, this is just Apple Maps, but um, people who are less familiar with mapping, they can get a very specific um, visual understanding of what, is, what exactly is going on in this larger area of disaster. Yes. Um, that is our demo. That is our uh, Zenny beta version currently. So okay, um, how does this tie into SDGs? Um, to be entirely honest, we didn't start this uh, application and project thinking about SDGs in mind. But um, as I was reading into this, it, it seemed like um, you know we this app would be related to something like Goal Three, which health and wealth being for people, or Goal Nine, uh, industry in, uh, innovation infrastructure. If you could say you know disaster response is a social infrastructure. But actually, I would like to argue that. Um, this is more in the realm of disaster risk reduction, which is a cross-cutting necessity, is a foundation <coughs> of many of, of the uh, SDGs. So let me first uh, express, uh, explain what a disaster is. Um, formally, it's, it's you know um, uh, an overwhelming of public resources. You know, if it's you know one injured person, one car accident, the, the official emergency services can deal with that situation. But what if you know that happens a hundredfold? then your, your usual responses cannot deal with the situation and your quality of response is also going to drastically drop. Disasters are volatile. Um, on a per annual basis, the statistics say that um, the cause of death, uh, the, of, you know, the cause of death is being disaster is 0.01% per year. So you might think this is insignificant. Um, but actually, uh, when a disaster, disasters happen completely infrequently, right? And then when it happens, it could suddenly become the number one cause of death and give you a significant drop in your GDP, as was the case with Haiti in 2010. It's also growing in frequency and scale. Um, in the past two decades, the, the per annum uh, frequency of natural disasters inc has increased from 200 to over 400. Um, and also, the, the due to urbanization, due to um, you know, increase of populations, in coastal areas, the, the risk of uh, disasters is also significantly increasing. Disasters are also disproportionate. So in develop, uh, when a disaster strikes, um, a developed country is, is more able to um, respond to that dis disaster and mitigate that risk. As opposed to a developing country, they're actually going to suffer tenfold the, the amount of damage in terms of lives, in terms of a percentage of GDP. And so in, in a sense, uh, disaster is this terrible penalty card that um, strips away all the development that you've had in terms of the SDGs. And, and uh, you know, and suddenly you might draw that card today or tomorrow uh, unexpectedly. And so disaster risk reduction is this um, realm that uh, UNISDR, which is the U UN, the you know, abbreviation for this, but there, there is a UN body who is um, tasked with this particular field. And they have these five um, action items that they are pushing forward, starting from the Hilgo Framework of Action, I think which was organized in 2005. Our app would tie into specifically early warning and strengthening preparedness for response. So to, keep it, uh, to turn it into disaster uh, risk mitigation terms, Zenny is an early warning system. Zenny enables community-based disaster management, and it crowdsources mapping of the, the capacities and the emerging hazards in a time-sensitive uh, time manner. And obviously, it's pretty damn cool. <laughs> but 
like in, in a real sense, um, you're able to actually address an audience who is more likely to look at their phone as opposed to you know go volunteer at the local fire department. Um, so this is a new novel way to get people excited about disaster preparedness. Um, so these are the references that I've based off the off of, uh, the, the SDR related statistics I just showed. Um, please take a look if you are interested. We have a lot of planned features. Um, and if there's any developers in here who are interested in helping, that would be awesome. Please come talk to us. We already have a landing page. We already have a beta going. So if anybody wants to check out our app, please uh, scan that QR code and just go to zenny.live um, and check out our app. Thank you. So the goal that we tried to tackle was number 12. Um, we thought about how we can reduce consumption in general and more on a micro consumer level. So basically one of the things that we noticed is that being in Japan, I don't know if you're aware, but when you go to a convenience store and you buy something, they have like, they wrap it in a plastic bag and they wrap that plastic bag in another plastic bag. <laughs> um, and then they ask you for another one on top of that. It's a very complicated system. So uh, what we thought of is like, consumers and users like, would want to reduce their plastic consumption. And we think that they would do that if there was a way to kind of brag about it socially. Um, and so, uh, kind of what we, like, we had an idea of giving, like, a point system for users on a, more of a, like, a social network type of scale for how many, like, plastic bags they use in a store, or even, like, having grades for, like, products that they buy in a store based on sustainability. Like, oh, this is something that's, like, really not sustainable that they're buying, or this is something that's, like, very eco-friendly. Um, and... So, but the problem then came like, you know, how do we track that kind of data? And so our idea was to build a, I guess we can build an API where we can at, ask and hopefully that companies with their CSR are gonna wanna contribute is that for any companies with like a, like a rewards point system that they could uh, send us data from their users about their kind of purchase history and what they're buying each day. Not necessarily specific goods because we don't want to, you know, violate privacy, but just in terms of whether they're paying that like plastic bag fee at the grocery store or whether they're paying or or like any grades of these products, like are they buying like things that are graded like really poorly on our sustainability like great artificially made sustainability grading scale. And as a result like users can then have a score or like, uh, you know, levels that they can then post about uh, on like a social network. Similar to like how people brag about how they run on like Nike apps and stuff like that. Uh, and so, yeah, that's kind of our idea. And we thought of an app. Seconds left. Anyone? Any questions? One question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. All right. Any feedback? Uh, uh, yeah, two two short things. Uh, uh, do you know how many plastic bags are being used every day in Japan? Too many. If you put them all together, very good answer again. Uh, if you put them all together and make a rope per day, they will reach and stretch around the world, but not around the earth, once every day. Uh, the, second, the second point here is incentives. Incentives make people move. For example, in Sweden, I can take an example. If you, if you change your, your conventional fossil fuel car to a biogas car, or like a, you know, a car running on banana peels, you get uh, to park wherever you want in the city for free. And that's an incentive, right? So incentive is something you should hold on to. That's very good, I think. Cool. Thank you. Sustainable, sustainability bragging. <laughs> I like that. Visibility. Yeah, very much. All right. Who's, whose team wants to go next? Yay. Come on.
that um, is very prevalent um, in all countries in the world, um, in all workplaces, even just in society in general, um, is a lack of equality based not only on gender, but also based on, uh, well, mainly gender. Um, and so uh, we decided to go ahead and tackle um, SUV number five because we believe that it's important to create as uh, inclusive of a society as possible that allows all individuals to participate in creating a sustainable future. Okay, and so. Do you want to do it's just reading. Yeah, okay, number two is <laughs> uh, based on SDG, we're, uh, we're going to solve, uh, sorry, um, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. <laughs> Sorry, we changed this very last minute as we were walking up here. Um, I like it. Yeah, so number three, uh, we came up with, of course this is a significant problem, and we could talk about this a lot, but there are two main reasons we came up with for why this problem is significant. Um, the first one is, of course, if you happen to be female or a non-gender binary person, having your opportunities in life limited is extremely frustrating. So that has really big long-term consequences on your negative health or your mental health, which can lead to all sorts of problems, right? So lower participation in life, in the workplace, um, bigger strains on like medical and social resources for people who are struggling with these problems. Uh, the second issue was economic. If you want to build a sustainable future and you want to build a strong economy, if you are ignoring 50% or more, if we include non-binary people, of your population, then you're at a big loss. Your talent pool is smaller. Your workforce is smaller. So by empowering women and girls and non-binary people, um, we have to address some of these issues. Yeah. So how do we do this? We have a system that produces a score <laughs> for a company. The, the score is produced internally and externally. For example, you could survey workers at a company to see how they feel about gender equality in their company. Uh, you can, and also externally, you can look at uh, sub or objective measures, how long people are staying. This score would then be visible to uh, potential customers and also potential employees. And um, basically, our, our product provides visibility for how a company is doing on gender equality. And if you don't like this, pro this company, you don't buy their products. If you're a smart worker you, and you don't like this company, you go work somewhere else. So it would help to balance it out um, in the market, I think. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's our draft. Cool. <laughs> So I yeah, yeah. This, is, this is so important, I cannot uh, emphasize this enough, but gender equality, of course, and also rights for LGBTQ people, etc. And, and, and here, I think the measurement, to measure sustainability is very important. We forget that sometimes. We move with our heart, not our brain. And to just move with our heart means like, it's like going on a diet without using a scale, you know? You have to measure. And this measurement is very, very important. Um, <coughs> There is a driver's license for sustainability called environmental label system or certifications um, that is decided by a third party, a neutral party, and there it's towards hotels, about uh, you know, everything from food to, to clothes to everything. And there's e even an LGBTQ certification system um, where they actually make like scores. So this is very interesting and I think this is very important. And once again, it's about the bragging thing in one way, because if you score, you have an incentive, and it comes back to that. Very good. Thank well you. done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. uh, we
We have these two teams. Who wants to go next? All right. Oh, guys, shine in if you want to. Hey guys, we're gonna start here. Okay, um, so our group, we had a lot of disparate ideas uh, in terms of like which goal we wanted to tackle. Um, but then someone came up with the idea of like, how about we, you know, how about we have something where you know we could rate products based on each and all of the SDG goals, right? Um, and so we thought that that's something that sounds really good. Well, um, Okay, who's our persona? Um, maybe concerned millennial consumers, CMCs. Um, <laughs> and he said, okay, uh, maybe the problem is there's a lack of transparency when you're making these purchases. You know, uh, like how does this contribute to SDGs? Um, this example of you know, um, trying to buy uh, sustainable earphones, you get like you know, the earpieces are made of uh, bamboo, but actually you know the rest is made of, of like unsustainable plastic. How does this rate in comparison to the other earphones? Uh, and so the current alternative is you have to do your own research. Um, our solution was, um, how about we have a Google Chrome extension over Amazon.com uh, that gives you uh, a rating um, of based on the SDGs, um, and it's, it's crowdsourced. Um, so, and so our unique proposition is you have a convenient way to get this woke information in, in quantitative, <laughs> like this, this transparent information. <laughs> I think uh, we were thinking also in terms of like UX and color scheme, like Amazon's yellow, but like we were thinking like maybe a green scheme would be good. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, if it's you know a questionable item, then instantly your your screen becomes red. Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone was that too fast? Subasa <laughs> talks too fast. So anyone want to clarify exactly? Uh, We're working on it. <laughs> no, but the great thing about making a Chrome extension is you can modify the experience of another website without approval of that website operator. Wow. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's how you can download videos on YouTube.com using an extension. But that's another story. <laughs> TripAdvisor, there's no rating for, you, you can't choose an eco hotel or a sustainability hotel. So what you guys here are suggesting is very, very important, and I think that will come sooner or later. The question is who will, who will do it, who will make it? So maybe you are the guys to do it. Uh, SDG <laughs> certification system. Yeah, very, very good, I think. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Last one but least. Team over here. You got it. approach uh, everybody chose three SDG and we kind of voted and we had three SDGs who were on a tie so we voted again <laughs> and we found uh, the life on land uh, we found that it was our issue so yeah I guess it's one and two <coughs> but, um, so basically this problem we thought maybe uh, for example, uh, the space allocated to nature is being reduced uh, more and more. Uh, so we thought we may want
want to address that in a way? Maybe? <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, if you've got the way land was previously uh, rainforest or jungle is now being, in Borneo, for example, is being cut down and used for palm plantations, um, and you have populations like orangutans or elephants that are being forced out of the area of that, as a consumer, you have no idea whether the products you are buying are contributing to that problem or helping it. And that is an information gap. And if you imagine for every product that you buy today, how many people know, for example, the top that you're wearing, where it was produced? Put, put up your hand if you know where it was produced. Well, we have, oh, that's, that's cool. Do you know where? India. Do you know the environmental impact of the top of the screen? <laughs> so again, I'm not an expert. I don't know, for example, whether growing cotton on one plot of land is more impact is is worse than, for example, creating uh, using oil from uh, to create something. But as consumers, we should know that. So, I, and our, our proposition was that if we know the impact of the, the items that we're buying, then we'll be able to make better decisions. So, so the expense, so the issue the consumer knows the, what is the, uh, the product that comes from the where and uh, how much resource is used. So the, we think the visibility of the product is necessary. The visibility of the how that the product created is necessary. So the, if, as the presenter show has a banana me, banana me pen, so it, it can be reusable uh, because if, if banana can grow one year, but if you use uh, like a plastic pen, it's use of petroleum. So it takes if you uh, re, uh, recreate the petroleum, it takes uh, like a million year. I don't I don't know, million year something. Many, many more. Uh, many more. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. If that uh, if you uh, top or bottom, if takes uh, uh, come from the you know, the tree, uh, some cotton maybe it takes uh, one year. But if you came if you you we are like a nylon or some the uh, uh, petrochemical uh, products, you can have to wear. The million years you, you, <laughs> you can watch that that makes that makes possible to show the uh, what you say the information for the products that are available. So in order to uh, make that information, we need some new technology. But uh, unfortunately, we are not a technology tech guy. So that <laughs> one idea comes from her, like the blockchain is uh, this is uh, maybe useful. The blockchain is the, everybody can share. The ledger can share to many people. So the, that for when the uh, pro producer uh, put the information, that information can, can carry to the like wholesaler, retailer, for the consumer. That information can be shared. Then the, everybody can judge whether that the product is made of the uh, reusable resources or the non recoverable resources. Or something. That's mm -hmm. our idea to use the blockchain to uh, tell the makes products the visibility judge the consumer whether they can buy or not buy the product. That's our, uh, yeah, uh, concrete. <laughs> It's very interesting. Uh, actually, the, we're coming back to the certification systems. Uh, it has been around for uh, 20 or 30 years, and there are hundreds of them in the world. But the common uh, thread there is that they are checking different criteria towards the three pillars, uh, people, climate, profit. So the certification systems are there. Uh, for example, we are fair trade, our company is fair trade uh, certified as the only the second company in Japan. And that has 100 criteria to reach or close to 100 criteria. So uh, asking one of my friends in Sweden who runs an eco hotel, uh, environmentally certified eco hotel, um, what they are struggling with is to keep track on all those 100 criteria. It's really a mess in some places, right? And to, to spread that to the employees, to the supply chain and everyone, that is a challenge right now as I, I have, uh, have discovered. So, there, your app could maybe make it simpler so that you can just in a few minutes check where you are right now. So I have a kind of 
live update or something. So I think this idea too, once again, is, is, is really great. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, big applause for everybody. All right, so uh, thanks guys. This concludes our meetup slash workshop. Really appreciate you guys staying late and, and, and kind of participating uh, in actually thinking about SDGs and, and, and sustainability, but not just listening to it. Uh, it's also amazing what you can do in 30 minutes, right? <laughs> uh, uh, imagine what you could do in a, in a week, in three weeks. Uh, we, we practice a, pra a, a, a system called a, a minimum viable product in our school, where we only think about what is the smallest product I can create to have someone test it and use it. We'll get feedback and improve it. So uh, this is just a, uh, we didn't go through the full exercise, but a small experience of how when you're given a small period of time, sometimes you can really get a good idea out and foster it into a product. So continue to do it. Engineers, you met with some great minds, have some good ideas, work together, vice versa. Brilliant minds, you met some engineering friends today, hopefully. Make sure you know some, at least two, three new people before you leave. That's the main intention of our meetups, and we look forward to doing more of these. Thank you so much to Pio and Satako for coming and, and doing this. Yeah, thank you very much. You can stay here for another 30 minutes. Uh, all I ask is go towards the drinks and mingle in that area because we're going to reassemble this back into a classroom.